There are two opposed views about the ultimate fate of human beings in Christian theology today. One is universalism, the idea that all human beings will be finally united with God in heaven, or at least may be. In either case, hell will or may be empty. The other is sometimes known as infernalism, the view that there will be some human beings forever separated from God, even though we may not know who they will be, and so hell will definitely not be empty. Hansers von Balthasar is among those theologians who count as a universalist. However, he distanced himself from the idea that universal salvation is something we can believe by faith. Balthasar supposed that an empty hell is something we can instead hope for, though not believe in. Three short works have been gathered in English translation under the title, Dare We Hope That All Men Be Saved. Balthasar's main defence of his position here was first published in German in 1986. Though he acknowledges that we do not know for certain that universal human salvation will take place, he treats it as something really possible. However, for infernalists, as Balthasar dubs them, though we can certainly hope that any given individual will be admitted to heaven, we cannot hope for the salvation of the human race as a whole, because we are bound to believe that some will be lost, even though we do not know who they will be. This is because, on the infernalist account, the actual human inhabitation of hell has been divinely revealed, such that universalism is outside the bounds of Christian orthodoxy, and so can hardly be true. From the first reactions to Balthazar's publication, the revelation that some will be forever in hell has been presented as a refutation of Balthazar's hope, intimating that his universalism is heretical. It seems to me, however, that both these views, infernalism and a hope for universal salvation, arguably lie within the bounds of Catholic orthodoxy. I do not mean to say that both are correct. Evidently, they cannot both be true. Either it is possible that hell will be empty, or it is not. Nevertheless, it seems to me that both views can be recognised as falling within the bounds of current orthodoxy. Consider how the claims of the classic Thomist and Molinist positions on the relationship between divine grace and human freedom cannot both be true in all their details, yet each falls within the bounds of Catholic orthodoxy, and neither position can licitly call the other heretical. I suggest that, likewise, infernalism and universalism as understood by Balthasar both fall within the bounds of Catholic orthodoxy, even if both cannot be true. However, while the Catholic orthodoxy of infernalism having been held within Catholicism over the centuries, is surely uncontested. That of universalism is contested, especially on the ground that infernalist teaching is revealed doctrine. Though universalism is certainly not a modern invention, it has become increasingly prominent in modern times. Since the Second Vatican Council, it has been embraced by a number of Catholic theologians. The extent of its contemporary support 
is reason to think that it is not merely tolerated in a negative sense, but has become more or less positively recognised by the magisterium as an arguable theological option, just as Thomism and Molinism are recognised as arguable theological options for explaining the relationship between grace and freedom. Pope St. John Paul II seems to have come to endorse it, when in his catechetical teaching during a general audience in 1999 he said, Eternal damnation remains a possibility, but we are not granted without special divine revelation the knowledge of whether or which human beings are effectively involved in it. Whether or which. In other words, for John Paul, it is not merely a question of not knowing which human beings are in hell, but a question also of not knowing whether human beings are in hell at all. The implication is that universal salvation is a real possibility, as is a populated hell, and both lie within the bounds of orthodoxy. We may wonder, though, how such universalism can be counted orthodox when infernalism seems to have scripture on its side. It is not my intention today to solve the debate on which theological position is correct. Rather, I shall say something favourable about universalism's orthodoxy, and in that context, offer something in favour of the truth of infernalism. My purpose is not to solve the debate, but to articulate a cautious attempt to reframe the debate. I will do this through a Thomistic Christological lens, focusing on our Lord's employment of the biblical charism of prophecy. Should my attempt at reframing be successful, I think we will be able to see more clearly how the theological debate can move forward. St. Thomas is certain that the earthly Jesus, who was fully graced in his humanity from its origin, always enjoyed the gift of prophecy. He was a prophet and spoke of himself as a prophet, as is clear from the Gospels, in fulfilment of Jewish expectation. While according to St. Thomas, he always enjoyed the heavenly destination of the vision of God, he had not already arrived, so to speak, in every respect, but was also someone on the way towards the full extent of heavenly glory, a fullness that extends to the body and the emotions as well as to the mind. And so, since Jesus shared our state in this way during his earthly lifetime, being able to suffer and die, he was a pilgrim through this life in some same respect as we are, sharing in our state of being on the way. Thus, through this solidarity with us, together with the sharing of divine knowledge with his human mind, he was able, by God's gift of prophecy, to proclaim what lay beyond the ordinary knowledge of his fellow earthly pilgrims. He was then truly a prophet, no less than the prophets of the Old Testament, who proclaimed what was yet to come. The work of the prophets in the Bible ranged widely, including the inspired interpretation of past and present events, but it also involved foretelling the future. Before treating of Christ's gift of prophecy in the third part of the Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas had already taken up this position regarding the future when looking more generally into the nature of prophecy in the Summa's second part. Prophecy, he holds, relates to what is far from our normal range of knowledge, 
and extends to future contingents whose truth is not yet determined. St. Thomas thinks, however, that prophecy of the future can work in different ways. This becomes evident when he considers in one article whether things known or proclaimed through prophecy can be false. St. Thomas knows the traditional answer and cites Cassiodorus's exposition of the Psalms as saying that prophecy is a divine revelation which proclaims events with unchanging truth, drawing the conclusion that if prophecy were subject to falsehood, its truth could not be unchanging. Prophetic knowledge, therefore, can never be false. However, St. Thomas was also familiar with the fact that some outcomes prophesied in the Bible did not come to pass. This was, of course, already a standard puzzle for interpreters of Scripture. And St. Thomas was aware of arguments based on the authority of Scripture that could be mounted against the view that prophetic knowledge was always true. And so in the second objection of this article, he quoted some texts of, from the Old Testament regarding prophesied outcomes that did not in fact come to pass. His first example was King Hezekiah of Judah, who was at one point sick to the point of death. Isaiah prophesied to the king the word of the Lord that he would die and not recover telling him that he must therefore set his house in order. But after Hezekiah had prayed and wept, the word of the Lord came again to the prophet, instructing him to inform the king that as a result of his prayer and tears, 15 years would be added to his life. In this case, the outcome of the original prophecy was not fulfilled suggesting for the objector that what is known by prophecy can be false. The objector's second example comes from Jeremiah 18, 7 to 8. The word of the Lord to Jeremiah goes as follows. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up or break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the evil that I intended to do. This principle St. Thomas's objector takes to be exemplified in the third text, which is from Jonah 3.10. When the Ninevites repent, following Jonah's prophecy of the destruction of their city, the text says... When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil which he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So again, the outcome originally prophesied by Jonah at God's command, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, did not come to pass. While St. Thomas was, of course, concerned with God's immutability and held that God's repentance or change of mind was spoken of metaphorically, his immediate purpose in answering the objection was to show that, even though outcomes originally prophesied did not come to pass, those prophecies were nevertheless true. According to St. Thomas, Truth involves a conformity of intellect and reality. While in these cases, prophetic knowledge and the actual outcomes did not conform, St. Thomas explores another way in which the knowledge of the prophet conformed with the knowledge of God from which it derived. He takes the view that, since God knows all things, this must include what are future contingents for us, which are all present eternally to him. 
Since God and his knowledge are eternal, nothing is future to him, including what is future to us. Since prophetic knowledge is a similitude of divine knowledge impressed by God onto the prophet's mind, say of some particular outcome, the prophet as such will have certain knowledge of the outcome as it is known in its presentness to God, even though the events remain future in time to the prophet himself and those among whom he lives. However, God knows not only these outcomes, but also has knowledge of things, as St. Thomas puts it, in their causes. As a human analogy for this, we can take the conjectural knowledge we human beings often have. What I mean is that contingents can also be known in their futurity by way of conjecture from their present causes where they are known as undetermined as yet to one particular effect. An example of such conjectural knowledge would be a medical prognosis. A doctor knows the causes of death present in his patient, from which he can conjecture that the patient will die within a certain future time span. Not that this is absolutely certain knowledge of the future on the part of the doctor. The matter is still undetermined, such that a different outcome is still technically possible, we may suppose through the timely arrival of a new drug or a miracle cure. Presumably a doctor in the time of Hezekiah could have had such conjectural human knowledge of the king's future death through certain knowledge of his present symptoms. The eternally omniscient God does not, of course, make conjectures about the future. But given that he knows all things, it cannot be denied that God knows things in their causes as well as in themselves. Indeed, when St. Thomas treats God's knowledge of contingents, he argues that God has knowledge of contingents, both as yet undetermined in their causes and as determined in themselves. So taking the example of the doctor and patient, God would have certain knowledge of the contingent outcome, both in its causes and in itself knowing both that certain symptoms are really leading to the patient's as yet undetermined death and the determinate outcome of the patient's death in itself. This would mean that it would be open to God not only to reveal to a prophet the death of the patient as a determinate outcome, but also to reveal it by way of its causes where the death is as such still undetermined. Thus equipped with both kinds of knowledge, God is able not only to reveal an outcome such as someone's death, but also to reveal that certain physical symptoms were really ordering a patient towards death. Sometimes then, Prophets may receive an impression of God's knowledge of some contingent as it is determined in itself in its presentness to him. At other times, however, God may imprint on their minds a similitude of his knowledge by way of causes. And this is what we have according to St. Thomas in the biblical cases of Isaiah, Jeremiah and Jonah. What is reproduced here from divine knowledge is not knowledge of outcomes per se, but knowledge of the order of causes to effects, where events can still unfold in a different way from what is prophesied on the basis of causes. In the example of Isaiah and Hezekiah, God knows by way of causes that Hezekiah's illness is leading to his death, 
such as not to exclude the possibility of another outcome. And this God initially impresses on the prophet's mind. As St. Thomas explains it, Isaiah informs Hezekiah that the disposition of your body is ordered to death. Likewise with Jonah, God knows by way of causes that Nineveh's sins call for its destruction, a knowledge which does not exclude the possibility of a different outcome. And God infuses knowledge by way of causes into Jonah's mind. While St. Thomas's purpose is to show that a prophecy of this kind is still true, because it conforms to God's knowledge of things in their causes. My purpose is to observe that St. Thomas recognises two ways in which prophecy can work. Either God reveals knowledge of an outcome, or he reveals knowledge of something in its causes, where the prophesied outcome may not come to pass. St. Thomas supposes that while both kinds of knowledge exist eternally in the simplicity of the infinite divine mind, an individual instance of prophecy as a finite impression made by God on the prophetic mind cannot match up to the whole of God's power, and hence does not encompass both kinds of knowledge at once. An instance of prophetic knowledge is of either one kind or the other. St. Thomas's account of two kinds of prophecy is confirmed by modern historical critical biblical scholarship. The co-authors of When the Son of Man Didn't Come, published in 2016, distinguish between what they call Mosaic prophecy and Jeremianic prophecy. Mosaic prophecy corresponds to St. Thomas's prophecy of outcomes in themselves. It is named from Deuteronomy 18.22, which comes immediately after Moses' recalling of God's promise that he would raise up a prophet like Moses. If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. In contrast, a Jeremianic prophecy corresponds to St. Thomas's prophecy of things in their causes. They term it Jeremianic on the basis of the principle found in Jeremiah, which was the second of the three texts St. Thomas used. The authors present this kind of prophecy as basically conditional. The prophesied outcome will take place only if some condition is fulfilled. For example, destruction will take place if the people do not repent, but conversely will be averted if people do repent. They argue that this form of prophecy was widespread in the Old Testament martial evidence to show that it was more typical of the phenomenon of prophecy as found in various cultures of the ancient Near East, and conclude that this understanding of prophecy was present in Second Temple Judaism, the New Testament, and the post-biblical era. This furnishes us with a historical argument to suppose that Jesus as a first-century Jewish prophet, would have been likely to have exercised Jeremianic as well as the Mosaic species of prophecy. Jesus himself seems definitely to have exercised Mosaic prophecy on some occasions. There is a very clear example of this in his prophecy at the Last Supper that before the cock crew, Peter would deny him. Jesus prophesied a definite outcome, which subsequently came to pass, proving in Mosaic terms that his prophecy was true. 
there is no reason to suppose that Jesus prophesied Peter's denial according to some condition or merely in its causes. What we have is the simple prophecy of an outcome and its fulfillment. That Jesus made use of Mosaic prophecy makes sense for one who fulfilled the Deuteronomic hope for a prophet like Moses. Another question is whether Jesus also made use of Jeremianic prophecy. The authors of the book I have mentioned argue on exegetical grounds that Jesus prophesied that his second coming would take place soon, within a chronological generation, on a condition that was not in fact fulfilled. On their view, the fact that the prophesied outcome evidently did not take place, together with their biblical faith that Christ was a true prophet, demonstrate that this prophecy was a Jeremianic one and not Mosaic. Their theory is of course controversial and I have written about it elsewhere. Today I want to bring these questions about Mosaic and Jeremianic prophecy to bear on Jesus' teaching as it touches on the question of universalism and infernalism. I have in mind such passages as Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats. The question is whether such parables, once taken as prophecy, are to be accounted Mosaic or Jeremianic. If at least one of them is Mosaic, then we can take Jesus to have prophesied the human habitation of hell, and the infernalist position is confirmed. But if Jesus' prophecies of infernal inhabitation were knowledge by way of causes, and a populated hell conditional on an as yet undetermined condition regarding repentance, then there is from our point of view at least a possibility that hell will not be populated. Given that there is the possibility that everyone will repent, at least in the secrets of their hearts at the moment of death, then the prophesied, then the outcome prophesied of a populated hell will not take place, just as Hezekiah did not die immediately and Nineveh was not destroyed. Jesus' words would have been true prophecy of things in their causes, where unrepented sin is leading towards a hell populated by human beings. But the outcome might still not ultimately come to pass if there is universal repentance. But while only one of Jesus' prophecies of infernal habitation being mosaic would serve to make the infernalist position right, nothing I I have said so far about the possibility of Jesus' prophecies being Jeremianic would guarantee universal salvation. On the Jeremianic view, universal salvation must depend on the condition of universal repentance being fulfilled, and we would still not know whether or not that will happen. But if these prophecies are Jeremianic, there is at least the possibility that the condition will not be fulfilled and this would be the basis of a legitimate hope that everyone will be saved. It seems to me that this would be sufficient to guarantee the orthodoxy of this kind of universalism, though not that it is theologically correct. Despite this, it is hardly clear to me from the texts themselves whether the prophecy exercised by Jesus here was Mosaic or Jeremianic. Kevin Flannery points out that the parable of the sheep and the goats gives conditions for damnation, such as not having fed the hungry, 
and so might be understood along the lines of Jonah's conditional prophecy. However, the key condition of lack of repentance is not explicitly mentioned in the parable. Nevertheless, even where no such condition for the outcome coming to pass is explicitly stated, such an explicit statement can hardly be required for a prophecy to count as Jeremianic. After all, in the cases of Isaiah's prophecy of the death of Hezekiah and Jonah's prophecy of the destruction of Nineveh, no condition was explicitly stated. However, if the meaning of Scripture in itself does not appear clear to us, we might suppose as Catholics who read Scripture in the light of tradition and with the guidance of the Church's magisterium, that the fathers and councils of the Church and so on may help us read it aright. However, when we turn to the fathers of the Church, as far as I know, they do not address this question of which of the two kinds of prophecy Jesus was exercising. And even if any of them do, that can hardly add up to any patristic consensus on the matter. Among the fathers, there were both infernalists in the majority, such as St. John Chrysostom and St. Augustine of Hippo, and also a minority of universalists of different kinds, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nazianzen, and St. Isaac of Nineveh. Without any firmer patristic consensus, I do not think that a Catholic can be absolutely bound by the Fathers to interpret Jesus' teaching on this point one way or the other. And when we come to the magisterium, though it is clearly defined that those who die in mortal sin are detained in hell forever, it is not so clear that the Church has defined that there certainly are some such who die in mortal sin without repentance. The magisterium certainly proclaims the teaching of Christ found in the texts of the New Testament, but we have no reason to suppose that the Church has considered and clarified the question of whether those prophecies are Mosaic or Jeremianic. Given that magisterial teaching is simply repetitive when it is not clarificatory, to that extent the Church can only have repeated Christ's teaching without clarifying the point at issue. This confirms to me that either position falls within the bounds of current orthodoxy, whether Jesus' prophecy is mosaic and infernalism is true, or his prophecy is Jeremianic, and both the damnation of some and the salvation of all are possible. But since neither tradition nor the magisterium has resolved the question for us, it seems to me to be a task for exegetes and theologians to explore whether they can illumine the character of these prophecies by their own methods, just as the conclusion of the Congregation de Auxilis did not exclude further theological work and a future decision by the magisterium. In what follows, without intending to resolve the theological debate myself, I shall give an indication of the sort of arguments that might be employed. First, it seems to me that an exegete might argue on literary grounds that a single prophetic declaration is more likely to be of a single kind of prophecy. This could be backed up from a speculative point of view with St. Thomas's idea that the limitations of any prophet's mind would mean that any impression of divine knowledge would be of one kind or the other, either knowledge of outcomes in themselves or a knowledge of things in their causes. 
When we look, for example, at the parable of the sheep and goats, we find one element that is surely mosaic, namely the identity of the judge as the Son of Man, with whom Jesus identifies himself in the Gospels. That the judge is Jesus is surely not something that depends on a condition yet to be satisfied. Rather, God wills Jesus to be the judge unconditionally. But if that aspect of the parable is clearly mosaic, one could argue that the whole parable, as a single prophetic declaration, is mosaic, such that the outcome prophesied includes the certain populating of hell by human beings. A second argument might be based dogmatically on our Saviour's perfection. It could be urged that a prophecy of actual outcomes, as well as of the sentences God imposes on sin, is a more perfect form of prophecy than a form which merely prophesies a sentence that may not actually be instantiated. If mosaic prophecy is thus more extensive and complete, more perfect than Jeremianic prophecy, and Jesus is the most perfect of prophets as head of the body, then it might be urged that Jesus' perfection means that he will only ever prophesy in a more perfect manner, meaning that what we have in the parable of the sheep and goats is a prophecy of an outcome, and so includes the human habitation of hell. I am not suggesting that either of those arguments is demonstrative. Rather, if the Catholic debate can be reframed in the way I have suggested, where both infernalism and universalism of the type advanced by Balthasar fall within the bounds of orthodoxy, because it is not immediately clear whether or not Christ's prophecies of hell are Mosaic or Jeremianic, then the reframed debate must go forward in part by theological attempts to interpret more precisely what is going on in these prophecies and what kind of prophecies they are. More broadly, we can ask what kinds of dogmatic theology are best equipped to contribute to this exercise. Since this framing of the debate supposes for the moment the possibility of universal salvation, but also the real possibility of hell, it cannot ignore the fact that everlasting damnation must somehow be compatible with divine goodness. Without that admission, someone might all too easily slip into treating universal salvation as necessarily assured. At the same time, any theology that wishes to take part in the debate framed in this way needs in principle to be able to handle the possibility of universal salvation as well as the possibility of the damnation of some. It seems to me that many theologies are not so well equipped to do this, such as classical Calvinism, to which predestination to hell is essential, and certain forms of Thomism that are insufficiently distinguished from it on this point, together with various forms of Pelagianism, where salvation relies ultimately on the vagaries of the human will, rather than on divine grace, and Molinism, which though distinct from Pelagianism, shares with it the apportioning of the crucial role in salvation to the human will. In contrast, it seems to me that a more mainstream Thomism, and the congruism at times favoured in the Jesuit tradition, whatever the weaknesses of each in themselves, are better placed to articulate in their own ways both infernalism and universalism as real possibilities, thereby clearing the way 
for genuine theological progress on this question to be made in the future.